Next to me now is the grave of Chief Antonga Blackhawk, who was the hidden weapon that waged a years-long war, the Blackhawk War, against the settlers. Now, Antonga Blackhawk was named Antonga by the Mexicans because he was a descendant of Turan Chichi, who was the leader of the Timpanagos tribe. And when they were contacted in 1776 by the Dominguez Escalante expedition, this was a united tribe that covered the Great Basin. And Timpanagos, the leader of this nation, uh, Turan Chichi, his son was named Chief Munch. And Chief Munch's son was Chief Sandpitch, who was around at the time of the Black Hawk War. And Sandpitch's son was Antonga. Well, these people were all engaged with the slave trade, and they were very well known for raiding across hundreds of miles. I mean, Wakara, who was also the son of Sandpitch, he raided all the way to California, stole a thousand horses, and came back. These people were great warriors of the Great Basin, and the Mormons didn't really understand the full extent of their ties to the Mexican state, and going back to the Spanish Empire, they didn't know what great warriors these men were. So in 1849, Antonga witnesses or hears the gunshots up Battle Creek, and he hears that a few of his family have been massacred. And he doesn't hate the white settlers yet. He understands that, yes, there were two raiders that had camped up Battle Creek and that maybe people got caught in the crossfire. Well, a year or two later, he's at Fort Utah, and he sees 100 prisoners of war marched in, and the beheadings start. 70 people are beheaded, and the heads are kept on spikes in front of a cage with women and children in it. And then the Mormons issue an extermination order for the Timpanagos tribe, and they go up into the mountains, and they behead the wise chief old elk, trying to sell his head for $300 to a local mountain man who wanted it as a souvenir. And they called him, by the way, Brigham Young called him Blackhawk because around this time, he started talking like a rebel. And Blackhawk was a chief in 1832 that had waged a war on the East Coast. So it's essentially the same as saying, well, you're a regular Che Guevara, aren't you? Well, Antonga took the name because he admired Blackhawk on the East Coast. And he said, yes, and maybe one day I'm going to strike you when the iron's hot. Well, eventually the iron became hot. His brother, Chief Wakara, died after a short war, the Walker War in 1855. And then Chief Arpin came to power, and he died as well in 1860. And he was succeeded by Chief Aeropin. Understand, all these chiefs are dying because people are starving. The Timpanagos are losing 80, 90% of their tribe, and the tribe is quickly fracturing. And this is a far cry from what it was in 1776 when they controlled literally all of the Great Basin. And Aeropin is in 1865 down in the settlement of Manti, and he's trying to reach an agreement with the settlers, and he's on his horseback when a man named John Lowry, he's a drunken settler, he comes up and he grabs Chief Aeropin and he pulls him from his horse, and Aeropin is in the dirt, and he dusts himself off as all these settlers are laughing at him, and he rides his horse up into the hills. This is the last straw, and he enlists the services of his relative, Chief Antongo Blackhawk. And Black Hawk, he has witnessed the massacre at Fort Utah. He has witnessed and lost family in the Battle of uh, Battle Creek or the massacre at Battle Creek. And this is the last straw. When he sees the chief of his beleaguered and dying tribe pulled from his horse, he sees this as a last straw. And by the end of that day, he had stolen 30 horses and killed five white settlers. And this war would last for several years. Brigham Young realized at that point he had screwed up. And so he ordered all of these settlements to fortify, make their own forts, or start heading up north towards Salt Lake where they were more easily defended by the Mormon militia. And Black Hawk and his band, because he enlisted over the next few years of war, he enlisted the Navajo, the Paiute, all of these people had been greatly wronged by these settlers. So they start raiding all these settlements as the settlements desperately try to set up these forts like Fort Deseret. And eventually, in 1866, he is shot at Gravelly Ford trying to rescue his friend and he starts dying of this bullet wound. It's a very slow death. So in 1867, he makes peace, and he says, everybody, please stop. But by this point, the war enters its final stages. It goes up to 1872 because the Navajo and the Paiute are still at war with the Mormon settlers. I mean, you can only strike somebody so many times before they say, that's enough. 
and they go to war with you. And he dies in 1870, but the raiding continues for a few more years until 72 or around there. And then even after that, there's a few minor isolated incidents of Indian violence. Uh, Black Hawk, he was the son of Chief Sandpitch, who was killed in Manti as well, even though Sandpitch was a good man and all he wanted was peace. Brigham Young ordered his arrest because he believed he could use Sandpitch as a bargaining tool to reach negotiations with his son, Black Hawk, who led the forces. And this only blew up in their faces more, which escalated the conflict immeasurably. Uh, and eventually, they found the bones of Chief Black Hawk, because when he died, even though he had made peace with the Mormons, the Mormons pilfered his grave and then brought them to the basement of a church where they resided for over a hundred years. Well, eventually, a Boy Scout found these remains and made a huge public issue about it, and he was buried here at this lake, which is around which his tribe had their sort of headquarters. This he used to be, again, Timpanagos, but at that point the tribe had fractured so much that they consider him now a leader of the Ute, but they made their camp around this lake behind me. I should correct what I have said earlier. The Mormons, they feared him, but they also respected him. So he was buried with his people in the mountains behind me, uh, up to the left there, and this happened in 1870. Well, four decades later, miners dug him up and displayed him at a local museum, and his bones were later found in the basement of a church. So the Mormons respected him and they liked him, but they also displayed his bones in an irreverent manner until he was given a proper burial in 1996, right here where his old village used to be. So you can't make this out to be the Mormons hated him or disrespected him. They displayed his bones because he was a great warrior, but eventually that Eagle Scout determined where he was and made it a public issue and he was given a proper burial here at the old home of his people. One of the saddest deaths of the Black Hawk War happened in Manti Canyon here behind me and Sandpitch was the father to both Walkara and Antonga Black Hawk and they were all involved in the slave trade. Well, as Black Hawk's war is taking off, Sandpitch thinks that he can make peace, so he gets on his horseback and in good faith rides into the town of Manti and says, I would like to negotiate terms of peace. I mean, if you negotiate with me, I will be able to bring my brother out from, or my son out from hiding in the hills and he will most likely reach a peaceful conclusion. Well, they say, well, you're in town already and we got a jail right over there. We're just gonna throw you in there. And once your son finds out about this, Antongo will ride right on down and negotiate. And it's at that moment that Sandpitch realizes that he has made a grave mistake. Stake. They take his offer of peace and they throw it in jail with him. And a while later, there's a jailbreak, 1866, and Sandpitch, he's on the run, and he's shot most likely in the leg and in the arm, and he's pretty gravely wounded, but he makes it up to the canyon behind me, and now he's being pursued by a posse of people from the town. And it seems that two settlers shot him. So they gave him a burial by sandwiching up against a cliff face and then shooting at the rocks above him so that there was a rock slide that buried his body. Now, we have been trying to find this for a while. The nearest I've gotten to it is a local told me, go to the mouth of Manti Canyon, find a log, and then continue on up a hill for about a half mile and you'll find a cliff face with bullet holes in it and he says I think that's it. Now I found no reference to that but I have found reference to a rock a ways south of town. I've got the GPS coordinates, it's on private property and it seems that somebody might have taken his body from that pile of rocks that the settlers gave him and they moved it down onto what's now private property but underneath a rock where his tribe would rally and most likely hold meetings for the next few years until they were confined to the reservation up in the Uinta Mountains. Chief Sandpitch is buried here, just south of the town of Fountain Green. This is on private property, so I'm not going to go over the fence here, but after he was killed in Manti Canyon, his band found his remains, and they brought him to a large rock near where he would have made camp with his followers and his people, and it is just beyond these trees here that this rock is. Uh, that's it, right there. And for a few years afterwards, maybe his people made camp here, but eventually, very soon later, they were confined to the Uinta and Ore Reservation. Here in the Little Freedom Pioneer Cemetery, you have the grave of James Onut. 
and the locals called him Indian Jim. There's not too much info about him online, but he's a fascinating character. The Town of Freedom was founded in 1870 towards the later years of the Black Hawk War, and it's just on the outskirts of Nephi. Around the start of this war, people had begun settling in this valley right here ahead of me. And when the war began, they had to kind of form little isolated settlements and fortify. Well, one of these was Freedom in 1870, and Indian Jim was one of those people that kind of grew up or might have even been sold to a white family when he was a child, and he was a scout. He would help the settlement by letting them know whenever Black Hawk's raiders were near, and the settlement pretty much escaped harm, and the locals in town loved him. They made a little dugout on the outskirts that he lived in with his wife, and he had a horse and buggy, and he always dressed nicely whenever he visited the town of Nephi, and he died in 1928 and was given a proper burial here with the rest of the pioneers.